You are very welcome to the Words of Wisdom series on Shalom World. This is the first of six programs exploring how we enter more deeply into the life of Jesus in the Eucharist. My name is Father Mark Byrne, and I'm a priest in the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, known as SOLT, S-O-L-T. And in this first program, I'm going to ask a very simple question. Where does Jesus go after I receive him in Holy Communion? The key to living a happier, healthier life is inside us. That's a quote from the cover of a book written by Julia Enders, an unlikely international best-selling book. It's not about your spiritual life. It's about your physical life. For Julia Enders was a German gastroenterology student doing her doctorate when she published her book in 2014 called Gut, describing one of the most complex and important and miraculous organs of our bodies and one of the most underrated. We're taken on a wondrous tour of our insights, beginning with the moment when the food first enters our mouth. We're told about the 100 trillion microbes that have to do with our digestion, our fat metabolism, manufacturing of vitamins, and also with our whole immunity and even our emotional stability. We're connected with our brains through a super fast highway called the vagus nerve. And that links our mental health to our gut, our insights. In gospel passages where we are told that Jesus is moved when he sees someone in pain, the Greek word used is splang nid zumahi. <laughs> in case you want to know a Greek word and impress your friends, splang nid zumahi. And that means bowels in Greek. It says in the gospel that when Jesus was moved, he felt it in his gut. In the Western world, the seat of our emotions is the heart. But in the Greek and Hebrew world, it is the bowels. I said that the book Gut by Julia Enders was an unlikely bestseller. Because although our gastrointestinal tract is a matter of life and death, it usually gets little attention. Once the food goes down the chute, as we say, it's forgotten. Unless, of course, we have digestion troubles or experience a strong emotion. We say, eaten bread is soon forgotten. What about? our bread of life, he who is Jesus. What happens next after I receive Jesus in Holy Communion? Where does he go? First, there is a transient union. The church describes it as a transient sacramental union, which ends once Jesus dissolves or is digested within the stomach in his sensible signs. So when you receive Holy Communion at Mass, Jesus appears under sensible signs of bread and wine. That is, things that are recognized by our senses. Size, weight, shape, color, taste, smell. But second, there is a permanent spiritual union in love and grace, a permanent spiritual union between the heart of Jesus 
and the heart of man, as the Father and the Son are one. Jesus has about 15 minutes with us in our stomachs before the elements of the host start to break down. That transient union is the same for all of us. It's the spiritual union that differs. When those 15 minutes have passed and the sacramental species have dissolved, where does Jesus go? Well, it depends. That's what we're going to answer. In 2018, at one of his Wednesday audiences, while doing a catechesis on the Mass, Pope Francis said this, Brothers and sisters, we celebrate the Eucharist to nourish ourselves of Christ, who gives himself both in word and in the sacrament of the altar, in order to conform us to him. The Lord himself says this, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. During Mass, after breaking the body of Christ, Pope Francis says, the priest shows it to the faithful. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. A wedding because Jesus is the spouse of the church. This invitation calls us to experience intimate union with Christ. Pope Francis continues, although we are the ones who stand in procession to receive communion, in reality, it is Christ who comes towards us to assimilate us into himself. There is an encounter with Jesus. To nourish oneself of the Eucharist means to be changed by the Eucharist, by what we receive. He quotes from the Confessions of St. Augustine when he talks about the light Augustine received when he heard Christ speak. Christ said to him, I am the food of strong men. Grow and you shall feed upon me. You will not change me into yourself like bodily food, but you shall be changed into me. Pope Francis says that as the bread and wine are converted into the body and blood of the Lord, so too those who receive him with faith are transformed into a living Eucharist. Those two words, living Eucharist, were my inspiration for pursuing this topic. I had read it, quoted in some of the saints in the church. And in my personal prayer with the Lord, I said to him, what is this, Lord? What does it mean that I am to become a living Eucharist? I didn't mention it to anybody. But a couple of years later, Pope Francis said it. And I said, aha, <laughs> now I have his authority to talk about it. He went on at that catechesis and said, because when you receive the Eucharist, you become the body of Christ. This is beautiful, he said. It is very beautiful. This is the wonder of communion. We become what we receive. This is the direction in which the Holy Father led us. The spiritual direction he gave to the church. Not us receiving Jesus, but the opposite direction. Jesus receiving us. Not us changing Jesus into ourselves, 
but Jesus changing us into himself, into a living Eucharist. This is why he enters us with his flesh and blood, soul and divinity, because he has to change all that we are into all that he is. Not just our immaterial souls, but our very physical beings, our heartbeats, our breathing, our footsteps, our thoughts. All the actions of our human nature have to be united with his human nature and taken by means of his human nature to participate with his divine nature. The priest says at Mass in preparing the gifts, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. He enters us in a nuptial manner to become one flesh with us. We receive him and he receives us and we become one flesh, one body. We say of natural foods like this, you are what you eat. We say of the Eucharist, you are who you eat. After the multiplication of the loaves and fishes in the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel, Jesus instructs the crowd who pursue him to work for food that will endure to eternal life. In the Eucharistic discourse that follows, Jesus uses the word life 19 times. I'll give you a sample. He says, I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in him. As I who am sent by the living Father, myself draw life from the Father, so whoever eats me will draw life from me. And that's only nine. Nineteen times he uses the word life. When the priest says to the communicant, the body of Christ, he's using an abbreviation because the Eucharist is not only the body and blood of Christ, but also his soul and his divinity. By using the word body, the emphasis tends to be on that part of Jesus. But it is not only his body, but his blood and soul that constitute his humanity, his human nature. And they include his breathing, his heartbeat, his thoughts, his desires, his footsteps, his words, his actions. And his humanity is united with his divinity. The divine life that he has in common with the Father and the Holy Spirit, all this is truly and substantially present in the Blessed Sacrament. It is the person of Jesus, all of him. This is the Lamb of God with his one and only life from eternity to eternity. It is his life before the creation of the cosmos, his life on earth, from his conception in Mary's womb, to his birth, to his public ministry, his passion, death and resurrection, his ascension, and 
all the way forward to his second coming at the end of time. All his life is one eternal act. There's nothing in him in potentia. What he did during the course of his life on earth 2,000 years ago continues in actuality in him. It is still happening at this moment. And even that which is to take place in the future in our human time is already present in act in him because he's a divine person. Pope St. John Paul II often talked about the necessity of a living encounter with Christ. What is that? What is a living encounter? Take two students learning about India in a classroom in Dublin. That's my native city. Both have books and maps to study the country and its people. There's even an Indian takeaway down the street from the school where they can taste different Indian foods. But one of the two goes to India for an extended visit. He travels the length and breadth of the country from the Himalayas to the Tar Desert in the north down to the southern tip looking out upon the Lakadive Sea with its rich marine life. And he also transverses the country from the Arabian Sea coast on the west to the Bay of Bengal on the east. He feels the great heat of the summer sun and the downpours of the monsoon rains. He boards the crowded trains and walks the streets of the megacities of Kolkata Mumbai and New Delhi. He meets Muslims and Buddhists, Christians and Hindus. He tastes different regional foods made from recipes passed on from generation to generation. He realizes that there is more to Indian food than the tikka masala, korma and rogan josh served at the local Indian takeaway back in his hometown of Dublin. He smells the smells, sees the beauty of exotic plants and animals and the terrible conditions of the slums. He stays with the family and is treated like one of the family. Maybe he even falls in love with a daughter of that house and hopes for marriage. From now on, Back in Dublin, whenever the word India appears in a news item or is mentioned in a conversation, it catches his attention. India is now a concern. Her joys and sorrows are his joys and sorrows. This is very different from the student who stayed in Dublin and learned about India mostly from books and maps and brief encounters with Indians. The one who lived in India has had a living encounter with the country and its people. The other only knows it as a concept. One has an idea, the other knows with his physical being. As in the words of the great Frank Sinatra Cole Porter song, I've got you under my skin. I have got you deep in the heart of me so deep in the heart of me that you're really a part of me. I've got you under my skin. One who has a living encounter with Jesus shares his joys and sorrows and the concerns of the church catch his attention and exercise a power over his heart and mind. Searching for fulfillment?
discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World.